We're going to move on. Our next speaker is Rick Lifton from Yale University, talking about genes, genomes, and the future of medicine. Thanks, Eric. I'm delighted to be here uh, today uh, to have a chance to uh, speak to you. I want to start with uh, the proposal that uh, many of the goals of biomedical investigation uh, revolve around uh, four major uh, prospects, understanding the pathophysiology of human disease uh, with the expectation that this uh, ought to contribute to the ability to uh, make early diagnosis, uh, enable prevention, and enable new and effective uh, treatments. Genetics clearly has had profound impact on our understanding of pathophysiology. And going forward, the one thing that I think we can safely uh, say is that we have great tools to understand pathophysiology, where that will ultimately lead us uh, in the ability to uh, diagnose, prevent, or treat disease uh, will really depend on what the actual pathophysiology of each is of each disease. And until we know that, uh, we really can't speak, uh, in my view, coherently about the, what the prospects are for uh, any of these alternatives. I do want to reflect uh, uh, on this anniversary uh, that we've been through, I believe, three distinct eras of uh, gene discovery in this explosion. And I want to make the point that each of these has been driven by saltatory changes in technology. And all of these technological advances have been driven by NIH and NHGRI. And I don't think there is any doubt that without uh, the focus and the commitment uh, to build tools uh, that we would not be where we are today. And I think it's worth reflecting on there are so many ways that this could have gone off the rails and not happened uh, that I think it's just miraculous and a real testimony to uh, NIH's and NH NHGRI's commitment uh, that we have come to where we are today. So those three, uh, uh, these three eras, in my view, have been the development of complete genetic maps, uh, the development of uh, complete lists of uh, variation of sequence, uh, and now the rapid advances in the technology for uh, whole, whole genome and whole exome uh, sequencing. And so when one thinks about uh, how this has transformed our thinking about disease, uh, as has been discussed, there are uh, thousands of uh, diseases that have been figured out now at the molecular level, uh, and you can't open any textbook of medicine uh, and not find organ systems and pathways that have been profoundly changed uh, by genetic contributions to uh, these uh, uh, disorders. And uh, this is uh, simply a list that I was thinking of uh, last night. Uh, and without any particular uh, uh, goal beforehand, I recognize that uh, all of these came out, have come out of the three different eras that I was just uh, alluding to, some from the early Mendelian era, uh, some from uh, genome-wide association and admixture mapping, uh, and some from whole exome uh, sequencing. And all of them, I think, uh, hit my list of favorites uh, because they have pointed to potential therapeutic applications that, or diagnostic capabilities that have profoundly changed the way we think about these diseases clinically. BRCA1 in cancer has obviously had profound impacts for the early diagnosis uh, and prevention of adverse consequences uh, of uh, uh, breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, we've changed fundamentally our view of uh, obesity from being a, a matter of uh, uh, personal strength and character uh, to one of biology with the recognition of the impact of leptin uh, and mutations in the MC4R receptor uh, to have profound effects on uh, body weight. Our understanding of Alzheimer's has been dramatically transformed from thinking, well, maybe these uh, amyloid plaques and the proteins in them have something to do with the disease and maybe not, uh, to recognizing that there's a causal relationship between uh, mutations in gamma secretase uh, and uh, Alzheimer's disease and similarly uh, rare families with Alzheimer's with mutations uh, in APP. A new insight into uh, sleep-wake regulation from the discovery of the gene for uh, narcolepsy. A recent finding that I don't know uh, how many of you uh, has, have, has really percolated through. If you walk into any dialysis unit in the United States, you will find an excess of uh, young African Americans on dialysis. This has been hotly debated over the years as to why this is. Is this simply a matter of access to care, uh, explaining why they end up on dialysis? We now recognize from the work of Martin Pollock, published uh, just this uh, fall, uh, that there are common variants in ApoL1 where the heterozygous state protects from uh, infection with the particular trypanosomes in Africa. 
The homozygous state as a pure recessive uh, increases the risk of going on dialysis by a factor of seven. This pro will profoundly change uh, the way we think about this disease. Eric has mentioned uh, IDH1 and glioblastoma multiforme, gain of function mutations uh, with large effects for uh, glioblastoma. Uh, and we've also heard about innate immunity and autophagy in inflammatory bowel disease. And lastly, NAV 1.7, if you're missing this channel altogether, uh, you're ostensibly normal, except you're insensitive to sensory pain, uh, which obviously has interesting therapeutic potential. In my own work, uh, we've started uh, for years with an interest in hypertension uh, for the primary uh, reason that uh, this is one of the major contributors to death on the planet. It's a major risk factor for death from the number one and number three cause of death in the United States and worldwide. Uh, and its treatment uh, is far from optimal. Most patients are not uh, adequately controlled, and most of those who are require three or more drugs, and its pathogenesis has been unknown. The reason it's been so hard to understand from physiologic analysis uh, alone uh, is demonstrated here in this working model for the regulation of arterial blood pressure by Arthur Guyton. Uh, and uh, you can see that this, uh, I think you'll concede that this is a pretty complex wiring diagram. Uh, and as a consequence, it's been hotly debated as to whether this is a primary disease of the brain, heart, kidney, adrenal gland, or vasculature. And this uh, struck us uh, now some 20 years ago as an ideal place for uh, it, genetic investigation with the idea that perhaps we could identify single lesions that would have large effects on the trait. And my one minor disagreement with Eric in, thinking in his uh, beautiful talk was he mentioned GWAS as the uh, analog of a Drosophila mutagenic screen. That would be like uh, Yanni Nusslein uh, going out to, to understand development by taking a collection of millions of flies and identifying subtle differences among them and then trying to understand development. That, of course, is not what was done. Mutagenesis was done looking for mutations with really large effect that uh, you could pin your hat uh, on and pin down and identify the molecular basis. And so the analog in human is to look for the extreme outliers that would be what you would get from a mutagenic screen if you could do one, which of course you can't, but the fact that there are six billion uh, individuals walking around on the planet, virtually every base that can be mutated that's compatible with survival is walking around somewhere on the planet today. And if we cast our net uh, wide enough uh, and are observant enough, we can find these extreme outliers in the human population. And we have done this repeatedly. And instead of finding genes that are distributed all across the physiologic landscape, uh, the genes we have identified that drive blood pressure to the either the extremely high or the extremely low end of the distribution all converge on a single final common pathway that regulates how the kidney handles salt. And these mutations are distributed both uh, along the nephron. If this is uh, one of the million nephrons in our two kidneys. Uh, there are mutations that alter uh, salt reabsorption along the nephron. There are also mutations that lie outside the nephron in endocrine systems that regulate the activity of salt reabsorption uh, in the kidney. So for example, uh, there's an epithelial sodium channel that uh, if you have loss of function mutations in that channel, you have a profound hypotensive disease that typically causes death in the first weeks of life uh, due to an inability to maintain a blood pressure due to a profound intravascular volume depletion. Conversely, if you have activating mutations that increase the activity of that channel, you have the opposite phenotype, uh, severe hypertension uh, manifest from birth uh, onward. Uh, in addition to finding genes that we already knew something about from prior physiologic analysis, uh, there are a number of genes that were previously uh, of entirely unknown function, such as the wink kinases, which we've demonstrated by subsequent physiologic uh, analysis are master regulators of many of these diverse uh, salt and water retaining pathways. Importantly, uh, these effects are not subtle and uh, they point to a single vector. There are diverse effects on potassium, magnesium, and calcium, but if you know what is happening to sodium and chloride, you know what is happening to blood pressure. Increased net salt reabsorption, blood pressure goes up. Net salt reabsorption goes down, uh, blood pressure reduces. And these effects are individually large. So we think uh, perhaps uh, one of the most telling features is that there are five genes in which loss of function mutations drive blood pressure to the extreme low end of the distribution in the human population, whereas gain of function mutations in those same five genes drive blood pressure to the opposite extreme. 
So the entire spectrum of blood pressure encompassed uh, uh, on, by the six million billion people on the planet uh, can be uh, found in, with just vari with variations in a single gene going from loss of function to gain of function, telling you the power of the salt homeostatic pathway uh, to regulate blood pressure. This has been turned into uh, 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 predictive medicine by applying diagnostic methods to uh, identify individuals uh, who have these mutations regardless of their uh, uh, family history or blood pressure, uh, and prospective screening is uh, quite successful in identifying these, and this is clinically important for getting these patients on the right treatment, and also in uh, mitigating some of their consequences. Many of these mutations result in cerebral hemorrhage at early ages. Uh, in this family alone, there are six people who died from cerebral hemorrhage before the age of 45, and we now prospectively screen these families for intracranial aneurysm, and in this family alone, there are two individuals who have been clipped uh, based on this idea. So if salt is so important, why aren't the diuretics that are the most commonly used antihypertensives worldwide uh, more effective as single agents? And why is the epidemiologic data relating blood pressure and salt intake so weak? Uh, this is a nice example where uh, finding the genes suggests uh, environmental interactors, and these extreme outliers can be used profitably uh, to understand basic aspects of uh, biology. So this is a kindred segregating mutations for uh, the thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. And if you're missing both copies of this, you have a syndrome called Gittleman syndrome, which is the most mild of the uh, uh, blood pressure-lowering uh, mutations. And in this kindred, uh, we identified uh, 200 descendants and identified those individuals who had two mutant copies of the gene, those who had one mutant copy of the gene, and those who had none and asked a very simple question. Uh, by measuring 24-hour urinary sodium excretion, uh, identifying how much salt these patients are actually eating on an, their own normal ad-lib diet. And what we found was that compared to their wild-type brothers and sisters, those with two or even one mutant copy of the gene are eating a lot more salt. This is not a subtle finding, and it makes a couple of important clinical points. One, when we give patients a thiazide diuretic and a gentle pat on the back and say, don't eat too much salt, we're ignoring the fact that the drug we are giving them is actually driving them to engage in the behavior that we're encouraging them not to participate in. Well, this suggests that if we really want to get where we want to go, we shouldn't be driving uh, uh, thiazide use to higher and higher levels without intervening with something that might blunt uh, the drive for di to increase dietary salt consumption. And this is one of the bases for combined use of inhibitors of the renin-angiotensin system along with diuretics, uh, which is becoming a uh, standard of care. The second point that it makes is, paradoxically, uh, it, uh, the, in families such as these, the individuals who eat the most salt have the lowest blood pressure. Of course, this is not a paradox when you understand why that is. They have a primary salt-wasting problem, and they're compensating by eating uh, more salt. This makes perfect sense in the light of the molecular understanding, but obviously indicates the confound in trying to simply relate uh, uh, dietary salt intake to blood pressure in the general population. In addition to uh, these rare Mendelians, uh, for diseases that we have not been successful in identifying rare Mendelian forms of disease, uh, we have uh, done a number of genome-wide association studies uh, one of these is uh, cerebral hemorrhage, a devastating consequence uh, frequently interacting uh, with uh, high blood pressure. And with Mur Murat Gunnell and others, uh, we have done uh, two uh, genome-wide association studies comprising 6,000 cases and 14,000 controls, and have a list of genes that are uh, coming out of these that uh, I'm very interested in. One of these is the same variant that contributes to myocardial infarction on uh, chromosome 9. And there are others that are beginning to emerge uh, as a pathway, uh, as uh, Eric was suggesting, uh, in endothelial repair. And a lot of work uh, will remain to prosecute this, uh, but uh, this is the direction that it's pointing. Uh, others have done genome-wide association studies for hypertension, and these have been among the largest disappointments uh, in the field. Uh, studies of nearly 100,000 individuals have explained about 0.2% of the variation uh, in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, uh, and uh, these will prove difficult to prosecute. There may be interesting genes under there, but uh, this remains to be established. Uh, in our case, uh, we asked a very simple question. 
we had three genes that, that in which homozygous loss of function mutations uh, caused extreme lowering of blood pressure. And we asked the basic question, uh, what is the prevalence of loss of function mutations in the heterozygous state in the general population, and do these affect uh, blood pressure? And to uh, approach this, we sequenced 3,000 members of the Framingham Heart Study and identified likely functional variants uh, based on variants that uh, are, occur at positions that have been conserved from invertebrates to, to humans, and we subsequently confirmed virtually all of these biochemically as loss of function mutations. So first, about 2% uh, of the population is heterozygous for mutations at one of these positions. Uh, importantly, all of those that are inferred to be functionally significant are extremely rare. There are no common variants with frequency 1% or greater. These are all uh, 1 to 2,000 to 1 in 40,000 in their uh, prevalence. Uh, and as I indicated, uh, we've now demonstrated that virtually all of these are biochemical loss of function mutations. Turns out that these actually have quite large effects on blood pressure. Uh, they reduce blood pressure at age 60 by about 10 millimeters of mercury, and this is sufficient to redu reduce the overall prevalence of hypertension by about 60% in the Framingham cohort. So these are rare variants with relatively large effects. So we're now entering into uh, this uh, third phase of discovery, which I'm particularly excited about because of the uh, ability to identify rare variants with large effects. Uh, and to identify uh, previously unrecognized Mendelian traits. Uh, in our own group, uh, Muram Choi, shown here, uh, developed the uh, whole exome sequencing uh, approach, uh, which is uh, about 95% uh, 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 sensitive and about 99%, greater than 99% uh, specific for identifying uh, novel uh, variants. And the cost of this is coming down. Uh, it's about $2,500 last year, uh, will likely be uh, about $1,300 this year. So to take advantage of this, uh, we uh, established a new uh, sequencing center uh, at Yale based on a different model. It's an open access facility. We didn't know what the demand would be in the first year of operation. Uh, 60 Yale faculty uh, have used the high throughput uh, sequencing uh, uh, facility, uh, and our throughput has grown from uh, virtually none uh, to about three and a half uh, terabases of sequence per month. So the applications will be uh, to identify previously unmappable Mendelian loci, dominant reproductive lethals we've had almost no ability to find, recessive traits with high locus heterogeneity, somatic mutations in tumors, and then rare mutations with moderate effect in common disease, and finally clinical diagnosis. Our first uh, proof of principle was uh, simply a, a simple clinical diagnosis. Uh, a boy who was referred to us for one of these renal disorders, uh, we simply sequenced uh, uh, his entire exome uh, and nine days start to finish, identified a homozygous mutation in the gene SLC26A3, which was particularly satisfying because this is not a gene that affects salt reabsorption in the kidney, but instead affects uh, colonic absorption of chloride. We went back to the referring physicians, uh, suggested a diagnostic test uh, that confirmed the diagnosis and uh, this enabled institution of uh, treatment uh, that uh, has uh, been sustaining for this infant. Secondly, uh, we've, Murat Gunnell has a wonderful cohort of patients with uh, arising from consanguineous union with structural brain abnormalities. Uh, this is a natural for uh, this kind of application because a novel homozygous variation uh, is likely to be uh, of interest. And in the, in the third exome that we sequenced, uh, identified a very interesting mutation. This is the MRI of a three-year-old boy. You can see the profound loss of the cerebral cortex, despite having normal cerebellum and brainstem. And you'll also note the complete loss of cortical folding uh, compared to uh, a control individual, uh, a normal three-year-old subject. So uh, this boy has a four-base deletion. Uh, in the gene WDR62 of previously unknown function. And then going back to this cohort, uh, it was interesting, without the MRIs, the diagnoses were all over the place, but once you had the mutations and you got the MRIs, it turned out to be quite monotonous. They all had uh, loss of uh, uh, cortical mass uh, and uh, loss of gyral folding, uh, and they all these patients all had homozygous uh, loss of function mutations in WDR62, uh, which turns out to be expressed in neural progenitors uh, and somewhat later in the uh, 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 maturing neurons. 
as an example of a dominant, uh, a new disease with a dominant uh, uh, de novo mutation, I'll give you this. Uh, Keith Choate uh, came to the laboratory with uh, these two photographs of uh, patients with a disease called ichthyosis with confetti. The ichthyosis is the bright red skin. The confetti are all of these white spots. And when I asked him what are, what's the genetics, he said there are uh, seven cases in the world. Uh, they all arise from uh, unaffected parents, no consanguinity, uh, and they're all singletons who uh, uh, typically do not uh, reproduce. And um, I asked about the spots, and he said, well, the sp we just biopsied one spot, and it appears to be normal. So that led to the thought experiment that what could this be? Uh, perhaps these, uh, this is a disease caused by dominant gain of function mutations, and all of these spots are somatic revertants. And how could you have high frequency somatic revertant? It would have to be some kind of recombination mechanism, uh, we speculated. So uh, we went on and demonstrated that uh, this is in fact true, which is uh, what's so wonderful about the technology. These patients have de novo mutations in the gene keratin 10. Interestingly, all of the mutations, although they occur from exon 6 to exon 7 and in the intron, uh, in between, they all lead to uh, frame shifting into the same alternative reading frame. And all of the white spots are independent revertants that have arisen by mitotic recombination having lost the mutant allele. Well, this is uh, uh, an example of high frequency reversion uh, by the mirror image of the well-known tumor suppressor uh, mechanism. And why this occurs with a keratin mutation uh, is interesting but presently unknown. I'll close with a uh, story that uh, is just published in Science Today. Uh, one of the major causes of severe hypertension on the planet uh, is aldosterone-producing adenoma. Uh, this is found in 5% 5 5 to 10% of patients with severe hypertension in hypertension clinics all around the world. These are interesting tumors. They are benign. They virtually never invade local structures or develop uh, distant metastases. Uh, and this poses the question, like other endocrine tumors, is there a fundamental mechanism that links the constitutive proliferation and the tumorigenesis and the constitutive hormone production? This was, of course, a very difficult question to answer uh, prior to the ability to do high throughput sequencing. So we started with a very simple experiment. We thought, well, we'll start sequencing tumor normal pairs and we'll go as far as we need to go. Uh, we didn't go need to go farther than four tumors to find a very interesting result. Of the first four tumors, the first thing we found was that these were quite bland tumors. There are, on average, two uh, protein-altering mutations per tumor. And in the first four tumors, one gene was hit twice, the potassium channel KCNJ5. That was not uninteresting uh, for reasons I'll explain subsequently. And we consequently uh, went on and sequenced another 18 tumors. And in the first 22 tumors we sequenced, there were eight mutations in KCNJ5, and they were all one of two variants uh, in the gene, G151R and L168R, and the likelihood of that occurring by chance is exceptionally low. So these mutations tell you what they are actually doing. Uh, the potassium channel has a selectivity filter shown here uh, from the crystal structure by Rod McKinnon. And the reason these channels are selective for uh, potassium uh, is that there's a gatekeeper uh, series of amino acids, uh, G uh, GYG motif, that is conserved in every potassium channel from archaebacteria to humans. And Rod McKinnon, back in the 1990s, uh, had, sh had demonstrated this selectivity filter and had demonstrated that the key residue, uh, G151, and this tyrosine at 152 uh, were key to the maintaining selectivity. And these two mutations in adrenal uh, uh, adenomas, uh, aldosterone-producing adenomas, mutate this uh, residue directly uh, and a residue in the uh, second transmembrane domain that interacts directly uh, with the adjacent tyrosine residue. So this predicted that uh, these uh, mutations would directly uh, alter uh, 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 sodium handling. And this indeed is the case, uh, not shown here, but uh, we've done electrophysiology, which demonstrates that indeed uh, these mutant channels uh, conduct sodium as well as potassium. And the consequence of this uh, is readily understandable. Uh, the normal adrenal glomerulosa where aldosterone is made, uh, these cells are hyperpolarized owing to constitutively open potassium channels. 
aldosterone gets made normally by either closing these channels in response to angiotensin II or by extracellular potassium uh, increasing, uh, uh, depolarizing the cell. This activates a voltage-gated calcium channel, raising intracellular calcium channel, uh, calcium levels. Acutely, this causes increased secretion of aldosterone. Chronically, it causes cell proliferation. So these mutations uh, do this by simply opening the channels, uh, making them permeable to sodium, uh, allowing cell depolarization, raising intracellular calcium, uh, and leading to uh, both uh, uh, chronic aldosterone production as well as uh, cell cycling. Now, you might have argued that uh, this is uh, uh, actually uh, may not be the complete story. Uh, there might be other mutations that contribute, and that could be the case. However, we now have five families uh, that have inherited mutations in, Men in a Mendelian form uh, that are associated with congenital aldosteronism. In this family, for example, this individual father uh, who was investigated here at NIH in 1957 uh, had profound aldosteronism at age five, needing both of his adrenal glands to be taken out. He had two daughters, both of whom uh, had uh, their adrenalectomy in childhood as well, and they have uh, inherited mutations in this same potassium channel that also make the channel permeable to sodium. So, uh, Past views on salt and blood pressure before the genetic era, uh, the Salt Institute and industry lobby like to say one thing we know for certain, salt does not cause high blood pressure. Uh, that view has changed. Uh, the WHO and uh, NHLBI now recognize the essential role of reducing salt balance in the treatment of uh, hypertension. Uh, early use of combinations of diuretics uh, and inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system are now recognized as a key combination. Uh, prospective trials have shown that if you reduce dietary salt, you reduce blood pressure. Uh, this has been modeled by Lee Goldman this year in the New England Journal to show that if you reduce salt by uh, intake by 25%, uh, that you'll have a profound effect to reduce the number of strokes, heart attacks, all-cause death, and uh, reduce health care costs in the country. As a consequence, uh, the Institute of Medicine this year released a study on strategies to reduce sodium intake in the United States focusing on the fact that a very large fraction of our dietary salt intake comes from processed foods, and if you intervene there, uh, you might be able to make progress. Lastly, on therapeutics, uh, we've identified a number of potential targets, and the most interesting thing is to find targets that have large effect on blood pressure but are neutral on the adverse effects. And for reasons uh, that are clear from physiology, patients who have mutations in the potassium channel ROMK have profound reduction in salt uh, balance, uh, but no uh, a discernible effect on net potassium uh, balance. Uh, and this has led to uh, this being a very promising target for pharmaceutical development uh, that is now in clinical trials in humans and shows great promise. So as we think about going forward in uh, using sequencing in clinical practice, uh, there obviously are tremendous capabilities, uh, many potential liabilities. Uh, who should we be sequencing and why? Uh, we should likely be using this to identify mutations that either establish diagnosis or markedly change our estimates of the susceptibility or that dictate therapy. There are already good examples uh, as, to, uh, as to where we might apply this. My own view is that in the near term, uh, we will have the greatest traction uh, when we focus on patients who are likely to have mutations that uh, are pathogenic, uh, but we'll see how this plays out. When should we be doing this? Uh, it depends on how you, uh, what the utility is. In Connecticut, we, we uh, do 40 uh, neonatal tests for about $40 on every newborn. Uh, one can imagine as costs come down, uh, one can imagine that uh, this might become cost effective, uh, but a lot needs to be uh, worked through. How do we deal with incomplete understanding of what every variant we see uh, means? We know from the exome data that uh, we will find uh, handfuls of novel variants that uh, are not present in anybody else that we can find uh, to date. How do we communicate these results? These have profound implications for, uh, for the education of healthcare professionals, patients, and social policy. And then lastly on therapeutics, uh, 
we need to uh, really help our industry colleagues uh, to focus on the best targets and to prosecute them uh, with passion. I think uh, it's safe to say that the core strength of industry is medicinal chemistry, uh, and they have been late to the game in understanding uh, uh, the meaning and how to prosecute biology. Uh, there's an awful lot that uh, we can contribute uh, from the academic community uh, to industry, and without that, we will fail to close the loop. And with that, I'll stop. But thanks very much for your attention. Time for a question, if anybody wants to go to a microphone. And I will then ask, Rick, what, what's been your experience in, in your clinical realm with all these discoveries you're making, the, the more general community or even non-community doc taking up the diagnostic side of, of what you're finding in, in hypertension? Yeah, so uh, I think we spend an awful lot of time uh, persuading people not to get molecular diagnosis because once you know uh, enough about the uh, molecular di about the relationship of genotype to phenotype, uh, you very frequently can uh, state categorically that if you have the following uh, ten clinical findings that everybody always collects. Uh, that that's pathognomonic uh, for the disease, uh, and uh, there's no need to pursue a molecular diagnosis. Interestingly, many patients want the molecular diagnosis uh, regardless, uh, and one of the areas that we are not very good at is inexpensively sequencing uh, single genes, and I think that's an area that uh, we would uh, clearly like to see uh, improved. On the other hand, uh, for the dominant traits in families, our experience overwhelmingly has been that uh, families are interested, want to participate uh, either in research studies or uh, for clinical purposes, and one of the uh, barriers has been uh, finding uh, inexpensive, CLIA certified uh, uh, validation uh, of these. Certainly for many of these dominant traits, uh, that has been very important. I think in particular with this aldosterone producing adenoma, one can imagine the possibility of having a diagnostic test uh, from the blood since there are only two, uh, appear to be two mutations. Uh, if you can get a sensitive enough test, uh, that could actually be very important uh, clinically. We now spend an awful lot of resources evaluating patients by very invasive methods uh, for these tumors, uh, adrenal vein sampling being uh, uh, the dominant method, uh, and I think there are great opportunities there. All right. Thank you, Rick.